Hello, I'm Pierre Portal, and this is a talk about my 2020 joint work with Dorothy Frey, building on previous work with Andrew Russell and Jan Rosendahl. So here is the result I want to discuss in this talk. This is a generalization of a famous result obtained independently by Peral and Miyake in the early 1980s about the mapping property of the wave propagator just associated with the standard Laplace operator on RD. So think for a second that in the theorem L is the standard Laplacian on RD. And what the theorem is telling you is that although the wave propagator is not bounded on LP unless the dimension is one or P is two, if you regularize it enough, then it becomes bounded on LP. Or put in a different way, the theorem identifies which are the Sobolev space of data that are mapped to LP under the action of this wave propagator. And this number here here is the magic number, it's known to be optimal even in the case of the Laplacian. So d minus 1 times 1 upon p minus 1 upon 2 derivatives are needed in order to map into LP in fixed time. So what we're doing here is we're generalizing this result from the Laplace operator to a class of second order differential operators with rough coefficients. These operators L, they arise as the square of Dirac operators. So they arise from a variation on the gradient in the same way as the Laplacian arises from the gradient. And the coefficients we're putting here are, are Lipschitz continuous coefficients with bounded derivative and the coefficients themselves are bounded above and below. But the key limitation in the theorem is that we want the entries of this Dirac operator to commute and for that we are imposing that the j's coefficient is purely a function of the j's component of the variable. But under these assumptions we can extend completely Peral and Miyake theorem and in fact we prove a little bit more than that. That's the point of this moreover component of the theorem that I will talk about in a minute. But before I do that let's step back for a second and ask ourselves is that a good theorem or not? Now, one thing I like about this result is that we're only using Lipschitz continuity on the coefficient. The usual threshold of regularity in this sort of question is C11. They are positive results for Strigatz estimate above C11 and counterexamples below that. They are also positive results below C11 regularity, especially very impressive results in general relativity. But these results are for fairly specific equation, whereas what we have here is a somewhat generic result for equations with Lipschitz coefficients. Now, unfortunately, the key word here is somewhat. I feel bad that Dorothy and I haven't yet really studied what is the class of operator to which our method does apply. In particular, we haven't really studied the perturbation theory. So because of that, we don't know how generic our class really is. And it's a fair criticism to say, well, it's not that generic at the moment because of this structural assumption. Now, this is true, this is very fair. Uh, I'd like to point out nonetheless that in dimension one, our class is generic particular because we do have perturbation theory in LP in that context. And I was a bit surprised to not find in the literature a result along this line, something that tells you that if you have a second order differential operator with Lipschitz coefficients, uh, it generates a bounded cosine family in LP. Now, if you know of such a result or if you have an idea about how to prove it, I would love to hear about it. But at the moment, I still believe that our result is new, even in dimension one. Now, last but not least, I'd like to point out that we're not just proving the result with loss of derivative, a mapping property from a sublet space of high order to a sublet space of lower order. What we are proving is the existence of a certain hardy sublet space that's left invariant by the action of the wave propagator. And what that means is that on that space, you can iterate the action of that operator and only at the end compare this space to sublet spaces and lose derivatives once, not every single time you apply the wave propagator. That can be very powerful to construct solutions to much more interesting wave equation. And that's exactly what Andrew Assel and uh, Jan Rosendahl have done recently for equations with C11 or slightly better regularity. Now this paper of Andrew and Jan and the paper of Dorothy and I that I'm describing today, they're really part of the development of the theme theory. And I see the starting point of that theory as being a paper of Andrew, Jan and myself a few years ago where we constructed the scale of HPFIO spaces. Now, we didn't do that without uh, inspiration from other mathematicians. In particular, we really built on the work of Hart Smith from the 1990s. But what we're trying to do is systematically bring the techniques that have been so helpful in treating elliptic and parabolic PD with rough coefficients in the last 20 years into the world of hyperbolic equations. 
And because this is so much about the method, that's what I want to do with this talk. I want to try to explain the method to you. So the heart of our analysis is what's called a wave packet decomposition. That's an idea that goes back to Cordoba and Pfefferman and consists in a refinement of the littlewood pele decomposition. So you take your functions, you look at it on the frequency side and you use Fourier multipliers to split it, first of all in littlewood pele dyadic annuli. And then if you're in an annulus that has a radius roughly uh, 2 to the j, j is a natural number, what you do is you split the annulus into further smaller pieces and these pieces are such that their width is roughly 2 to the j of 2. So it's sometimes called a dyadic parabolic scaling because you have a parabolic relationship between the scaling in the direction of the wave packet and the orthogonal direction. And you use Fourier multiplier to essentially localize, okay, we use smooth cutoff to one of these sub-regions of the littlewood pele dyadic annulus. So the way we implement this wave packet decomposition is by using a wave packet transform. We use a family of Fourier multipliers that do some localization on the frequency space. And this localization has this anisotropy that it takes a preferred direction omega and scale in that direction like one upon sigma, but scales in the orthogonal directions like one upon square root of sigma. So this is localizing into these regions that I was drawing before. And you should think of the wave packet transform as a lift from L2 of the physical space RD into L2 of phase space, but you are decomposing the momentum variable into its direction, which is on the unit sphere, uh, and one upon the size of momentum, which is the variable we call sigma here. And the key technical thing to remember about this decomposition is that if you're in a dyadic analyst roughly of radius 2 to the j with a very large j, then what's happening is that these regions are becoming very, very thin. The difference between the preferred direction omega and the direction of any eta inside that region is roughly 2 to the minus j over 2. So as you send j to infinity, you're essentially picking up one direction, and that's going to be critical to our analysis. It's going to make things look asymptotically one-dimensional. The way I like to think about it heuristically is that you know, high momentum wave packets don't muck around. They pick a direction and they go there and only there pretty fast. Now, this wave packet transform implements an isometry between L2 of the physical space and L2 of phase space. So here it is as an isomorphism. Of course, you can make it an isometry by appropriately normalizing your cutoffs. Uh, one thing you should notice is that we're only using the wave packet refinement of the Pele decomposition when sigma is small. When we deal with large values of sigma, then we purely use a Littlewood Pele decomposition because that's good enough for our analysis. The refinement is important asymptotically. It's important when we deal with large momentum, which is to say we deal with small values of sigma. Now, in a few minutes, I will show you how we use this L2 isometry and construct an LP theory based on it using Hardy space methods. But before I go there, I want to point out the key technical idea and the proof that fundamentally exploit the nature of this decomposition. So let's have a look at these two operators. We have a wave propagator here and we have a transport here. These are Fourier multipliers respectively with symbol exponential i length of xi and exponential i omega dot xi. If you want to discuss the LP mapping properties of these operators using your favorite Fourier multiplier theorem or spectral multiplier theorem of Fermi and the type, you won't be getting very far at all. In fact, you won't even be able to prove that this transport is LP bounded, which is really silly because it obviously is. It is just a translation operator. Now, going beyond that, you certainly won't be able to discuss the optimal subordinate space mapping property of the wave propagator in that way. However, and that's where the miracle is, when you look at the difference between the two and you restrict your attention to the support of a wave packet, then a Fourier multiplier will be able to describe quite properly the LP mapping properties of this operator. So if you restrict that to the support of a wave packet, and let me remind you that this support is such that if this is non-zero, then omega dot xi is roughly one upon sigma, and nu dot xi is smaller than one upon square root of sigma when nu is orthogonal to omega, 
Uh, let's have a look at the Fourier multipliers with these symbols and let's try to prove that they are LP bounded uniformly in sigma and omega. So maybe just to simplify, let's take omega equal E1 for now. It all works the same for uh, other directions. And if I take psi 1 and I differentiate m sigma omega in that direction and I take the supremum over all non-zero psi, this is the quantity I need to control to apply my Ermenda multiplier theorem. And um, what I'm going to get from that by a little bit of computation is that what I really need to be able to control is the supremum of Xi1 times Xi divided by Xi1 minus 1 in the region where Xi1 is roughly 1 upon sigma and Xi j is smaller than 1 upon square root of sigma when j is above 1. And now I'll let you do that exercise. You can find that this is uniformly bounded, uniformly in sigma. So this allows you to apply a multiplier theorems and prove uniform boundedness of the Fourier multipliers with this symbol in LP for all P in the reflexive range uniformly in sigma and in omega. And that is a critical aspect of our proof. So asymptotically in the regimes where sigma is very close to zero, once we implement the wave packet transform in an appropriate unconditional LP way, we essentially won't see the difference between a wave propagation and a transport in the direction of the wave packet. This is done here with Fourier multipliers in the simplest case where my operators don't have coefficients, but appropriate functional calculus technique will allow you to move that into the realm of operators that do have uh, non-trivial and in fact rough Lipschitz continuous coefficient. The point really is that the way we prove the boundedness of that in LP is not using any advanced Fourier integral operator theory. It's using basic Fourier multiplier theorem because on the support of the wave packet transform, these two symbols are close enough to each other. So to finish, I'd like to very briefly show you some of the other ideas that appear in the paper. Now, the first one is using transference of groups of operators to move from the Fourier multipliers to the operators that we need to analyze with non-constant but Lipschitz continuous coefficients. So the first point is that you can study an ordinary differential equation or a system of such equations involving the AJ's coefficient and from that you will get that the Dirac operator DA generates a bounded group of composition operators on LP for OP with finite speed of propagation. You have an explicit expression of that as a composition operator. Now we need to know more about this transport group and the first thing we have which is extremely helpful for the L2 analysis is that in L2 it is similar to the classical translation group. We get that out of the stone foneman theorem by explicitly constructing a position operator adapted to this non-standard momentum operator and then applying the stone foneman theorem to get that similarity. So in L2 that allows us to transfer all sort of results about this kind of Fourier multipliers to the transport group that we are interested in. This is all good and well in L2, but what do you do in LP? Well, LP is a perfect example of what we call a UMD Banach space. And on that Banach space, we have a bounded group. So there is a functional calculus for the generator of that group uh, using a Fourier transform type formula, which is called the Phillips functional calculus. And what the Kaufmann vice transference principle tells us is that you can estimate norms of operators in that functional calculus using a Fourier multiplier, but extending this Fourier multiplier as an operator acting on LQ of RD with value in your Banach space X. Now, X will typically be LP, but it will also be the Hardy Sobolev spaces that I'm about to describe. And those spaces are also UMD spaces. And the beauty of transference is that it doesn't really matter what these spaces are as function spaces, as long as they are UMD Banach space, I can control the functional calculus of my operator DA on those spaces, provided I have at my disposal appropriate theorems about Fourier multipliers which do take value in an appropriate Banach space. But fortunately in 2020, we have quite a lot of such results available of UMD valued Fourier multiplier theorems. And that's what we use in the paper.
Now I can finally define for you the Hardy subref spaces that we use in this paper. And to do that, I'm going to see them as subspaces of some kind of 10 spaces, like all the Hardy spaces that came before them. And more in the spirit of this talk, I'm going to think about them as being subspaces of spaces over phase space. And the specific type of square function spaces over phase space that I'm going to use are the so-called LP with value in TP2 spaces. I've given their norms here, and let me briefly run you through that norm to understand what it does. So what we do is, well, with respect to the physical variable, we just take an LP norm. With respect to the angular component of the momentum variable, we average over all directions in an LP way. And then what we do with respect to the scale variable sigma, which remember is one upon the radial component of the momentum variable, then on that we do take a L2 norm with respect to the measure d sigma over sigma. So it's a square function norm in that sense. It has an extra twist, which is these averages here. This is the typical 10 space twist, which means that we're not really looking at the function pointwise. We always average the function over balls in the physical space Rd at the appropriate scale. So that gives a little extra smoothing of all the objects we look at, and this extra smoothing is just ridiculously useful technically, and it does not turn out to be some kind of cheat because we do get the optimal LP mapping properties from that. So we're gonna see our Hardy spaces as subspaces of that, and you can see all sorts of classical Hardy spaces as subspaces of functions of a space space of that form. For instance, if you take the most classical real variable Hardy space defined by Pfeffer and Einstein back in 1972, the way you see it as a subspace of L1 with value in T12 is by using Fourier multipliers to get Littlewood Paley pieces of your function, and that gives you a function of the original spatial variable x, the scale variable sigma, and that function is just constant in the angular part of the momentum omega, and that gives an equivalent norm to the classical Hardy space H1. So now, to get our Hardy Sobolev FIO spaces associated with dA, we have to do two things. First of all, we are not using Fourier multipliers. We're using the Phillips functional calculus of the transport group. So here, all our cutoffs are defined in terms of this functional calculus instead of being defined in terms of Fourier multipliers. Secondly, to get Hardy Sobolev FIO spaces as opposed to not FIO spaces, we follow the wave packet transform philosophy. So when sigma is large, that is to say when we deal with low values of the radial part of the momentum, then we just use a little Paley type decomposition. But when sigma is close to zero, we refine that in the wave packet transform way. So using wave packet transform here, and this is now dependent on omega, and we're going to average over all those omega. And then that gives you HP FIOA if you want, and if you want HP S FIOA, so you want a regularity parameter S and Hardy Sobolev spaces as opposed to just Hardy spaces, all you have to do is add some weights to this part that correspond to the, the interesting values of the scale variable. And that gives you the appropriate scale of spaces. Now the question is, how do I prove everything I need to prove on these spaces? So we need to prove that the transport group is a bounded group on these spaces, and we need to prove that the resolvent of the operator L map these spaces in the right way, so just change the regularity parameter, and we need to show that you can swap the transport group and the wave propagator thanks to a Fourier multiplier argument and the, the transference property for the, the transport group. So all of that is based on key properties of the functional calculus of dA that are similar to heat kernel estimates. So here they are. These are the appropriate analog of heat kernel estimate that allow you to do on these Hardy FIOA spaces, all of the things that I mentioned earlier. Now, I'd like you to take away two messages about these DK estimates. First of all, there is some numerology here in the way they scale, and that numerology drives this optimal value of the regularization parameter d minus one times one upon p minus one upon two at the end of the day. So this numerology really comes from the nature of the wave packets. Now, second of all, the decay is not in terms of the standard Euclidean distance on Rd, it's in terms of this potentially strange looking anisotropic distance adapted to the direction omega. Now this distance itself 
comes from a distance on cosphere bundle on rd cross sd minus one that caps your the contact geometry on that cosphere bundle so there's really a geometric idea in the use of this metric that allows us to bring ideas from the parabolic world into the hyperbolic world we do not have standard heat kernel type decay estimates that could be helpful here because we're not dealing with a diffusion problem we're dealing with a wave equation problem but we do have parabolic type decay estimates if we look at the problem in the appropriate geometry on phase space. And I'm going to stop here. Many thanks for your attention.